We're going to be reading from Psalm 145 and uh, reading the first 12 verses. You can find it in your Bibles about midway through Scripture. And we encourage you, as always, bring your own Bibles, use your electronic versions, whatever the case may be. Borrow Bibles from the back. We also put it on the screen, but it's good to have it in front of you. So Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Lord, bless the reading of your word, bless the words that you've given to me this morning, and open our hearts to you and to what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 145 is a hymn to the Lord, the great King, for his mighty acts and benevolent virtues, which are the glory of his kingly rule. I'm reading from the NIV text notes. But you can tell that when you read Psalm 145, can't you? That this is about the great king, God himself. And so what we have here is an exaltation of God. This is worship. This is worship of extolling him, praising his name, and uh, exalting him. That's worship. And worship in Psalm 145, and worship for us too, is about God. God is the center of this. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever. And as we do that, it's us. Your saints will extol you. They will tell the glory of your kingdom. That's you and that's me, saints. Not because we're special, we got a halo on or something like that. The specialness is simply that we belong to God. And that makes us his saints. And so together we extol him. And that's what's there in Psalm 145. And in Psalm 145, you will notice that also it's multi-generational. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And as we read that, it's very easy to look at that and think, yeah, of course. An older generation will share with a younger generation what they have learned about God, experienced about God, what they know about God. And that is as it should be. But it says each generation will commend your works to another. And I can imagine a younger generation also commending God's works to another generation, to an older generation, for instance. Because each generation has their own experience of God, don't they? And so it is that a younger generation, too, will have their own experience, like at a change conference, where that music and some of the things that were sung and speakers changed their lives, and that's God. And so what happens is worship Worship comes. Because worship is a response from our hearts then to God, to who He is, to what He's done. Just as it is in here, who He is, what He's done. He's the great King. He's tender, compassionate. He's good. 
And he has done mighty acts and powerful deeds. And so we worship. As David did. As the people of Israel did. And one generation to another. And that is the context then to what we're talking about this morning. Because this morning what we're talking about the second of six themes that are in this booklet that we shared with you back in June. You can get some, there are still some extra copies at the Information Center. And it is the product of uh, a weekend, a discovery weekend, prayer time and so on, late last year and then the wrestling of the planning team since them with it to say, what is God saying to us? Where is he taking us as a church? What's the next chapter? And so we are walking through these themes, six of them, uh, through the fall. We're alternating weeks with classical appointments. So last week was a classical appointment, another pastor from within the region of Christian Reformed churches. But the week before that, we started with the first theme, which was prayer. This week, we will continue on with the second theme, which is worship. Everything we do. Everything we do is worship. Everything you do in your family, in your household, in your work, and everything else, everything I do, is worship because we do it for God or we do it for a false God. But worship, as we're talking about it this morning, the theme is what we do here. What we do in this service and at the Sunday evening service together as God's people. Now in your bulletin you will find an insert. It looks like this. Headed up, loving God. And it says worship. I want to invite you to haul it out and to follow along with me. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from that insert. The goal that the planning team felt was emerging from that a discussion summary of the discussion from that weekend, and then some of the suggestions, not all of them, but some of the suggestions that came out of that weekend that seemed, uh, that seemed like they, were, they resonated. So goal, to create a culture of God-centered congregational worship that involves all generations. When we worship together, we are collectively an instrument of worship. Discussion summary. A strong desire was expressed for our children and youth to be more involved in worship. There was a desire for more sharing of testimonies and stories and services, as well as for more opportunities to respond to the word and worship. There was also a desire for more freedom of expression and spontaneity in worship, encouraging us to grow in being able to engage our hearts more fully in worship together. Some suggestions include more teaching and preaching on congregational worship, that's one, how the Holy Spirit moves in worship, how to navigate the range of personalities in worship, encouraging a range of how we express ourselves in worship while being clear about community parameters of worship together. Two, work with worship teams so that they share a common understanding of congregational worship and are on the same page as we lead us in worship. Three, intentionally include a range of generations in worship services, especially children, youth, and young adults, to offer training and equipping and safe times and places to learn how to lead in worship, and to include more sharing of testimonies and stories in our worship services that can encourage the congregation. Now, last, uh, two weeks ago, I made a general comment about the themes. I said that the themes were not so much about specific programs or techniques, things that you could just implement right away, but much more about our church culture, about who we are and how we do things and what we value and what we want to be like, what we believe God wants us to be like. And this week, I want to add another comment to this about the, th the six themes, and that's this. The themes are not just tidy little boxes, but they cross over into each other. 
Two weeks ago, when I talked about prayer, and we looked at that, we talked also about worship, because we talked about prayer within our worship services. And this week, we're going to be talking now about worship, but in two weeks' time, Lord willing, we're going to be talking about the next thing in there, which is about engaging future generations. It's about being multi-generational. It's about that gap in us that's around the age of millennials and of young people, young adults, young families, and so on. But we're going to be talking about that already this morning because it crosses over into worship. You will have heard that already in there that we're talking about having youth and young adults more visibly involved in worship and so on. So that the, these things cross over with each other. And as we talk about it this morning, what I want to do is pick up on some words in the goal and weave through this as well some of the discussion summary. So to create a culture of worship. And what that means then is more than just programs or techniques or things like that. You know, we're going to do this kind of music, we're going to have that kind of instrument, we're going to, whatever the case may be, but a culture of worship. And one of the things that I want to say about us is that we have a love for worship, I believe. We've see, you, you can sense it around here when we sing together. And there's a long history of that. I don't know if you know, but in the old church building way back in the day, before air conditioning, they'd open the windows and the neighbors would hear them singing. And they were known as, we were known as, the singing church. Now worship is more than merely singing, because you can sing all kinds of things in all kinds of groups. Worship is the heart that comes out of that towards God. And we are a church that loves worship. And I don't ever want to see that change. We don't ever want to see that change. We want to worship. We want to grow in worship. We want to cultivate worship and be intentional about that. So that we're known as people who love Jesus. God-centered worship. Worship needs to be centered on God. It's about Him. It's about glorifying Him. That's Psalm 145. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about how I feel in worship. Although there should be feelings, maybe not all the time, but there should be feelings because we are emotional beings too. But it's not about me. It's not about what I get out of it. It's about God. And that's why when we come to worship, even if we're not feeling like it, to give our heart to him anyway and to worship him because he's worthy of it. And that's why part of cultivating a culture of worship is to cultivate our own hearts then so that we know God more, love him more, know him in, in intimate ways and as our father and so on because that will shape and form our worship but it's God-centered. It needs to be God-centered. And it needs to be congregational worship. That is to say, our public worship is us. It's we gathered together here. It is in the Old Testament what was called the Assembly of Israel gathering together. It's why some of the Psalms will talk about, I will declare your mighty acts in the assembly. I will praise your name in the assembly. We are the assembly when we gather together here. And so that has implications for us. Because on the one hand, we want more range of expression in our worship. On the other hand, we also want to be careful that it doesn't become about private displays that really are about me rather than about God. And the sort of thing then that as people come through these doors, don't know worship, don't know what it looks like, are drawn to rather than repelled by. We are individuals, and so individually we worship, but together we become a collective. And together we raise God's name in this place. And it should be worship that involves all generations. Now that has a number of different directions that you can go with that. First of all, it means something about what we do in worship and how we do it. Style of worship, for instance. 
because there are differing styles and differing generations in that. And so, and, and, and differing personalities and so forth. And so what we want then in worship is to see a broad stream of worship, broad enough that it can take in some of the currents, some different currents that are in it, but that we know what we're doing here congregationally in terms of worship. It means, though, that we are probably, and we'll probably talk more about this in two weeks' time, we're probably going to want to tilt younger. And that has implications for us because it means then that people like myself and others will need to let go of some things sometimes. And the thing is, Scripture talks about singing a new song. And there will be new songs. And the songs will be from a new generation, another generation. And they will speak in those songs to us of what God, who God is and what he has done. So one of the things that you can expect going forward is a little discomfort from time to time. And a little bit of stretching that will be required from time to time as we figure out where this goes. And we don't really know for sure what that looks like, but it has to be a culture of worship, it has to be God-centered, it has to be congregational, and it has to be involve all generations. Now, involving all generations means, too, that we can't just sit on our hands and say, oh, I'm not going to sing that song, or I'm not going to worship this morning, whatever the case may be, I don't like the praise team, or whatever. I don't know what it is. Got out of bed the wrong way? Whatever. No. No, we give ourselves to worship. All generations give themselves to worship. I want kids to be giving themselves to worship. I want 80 and 90 year olds to be giving themselves to worship. I want to give myself to worship. And that means my heart, your heart, our hearts engaged together, not disengaged. All generations. It also means that we want to have other generations involved in our praise teams. We want to have children and youth involved in the praise teams. And we've been doing some of that, but there's more intentionality that I think is probably required for that. And we want that because it needs to be all generations together praising God. Also, who you have visibly up front says something to a visitor as well. I remember hearing a number of years ago a guy who worked with millennials, and uh, he wasn't himself a millennial, but man, did he have an amazing church in Hamilton that way. And he talked about going to a church down in North or South Carolina, and he said it was great worship. He loved it. It was uh, rock and roll. And it was old-style rock and roll. And he looked at the guys in the band, and they were all, you know, 60, 70 years old. And he looked around the church, and they're all 60, 70 years old. And he says, That's, there's a reason for that. Because you say something about who you are and who's welcome here by who you have in visible ministry. And so we need to be working at that as a visible ministry in terms of who is up here and, and, and so on and be introducing younger generations in it. And it's not just visible ministry. It's also our tech ministry, uh, behind the scenes, and it's other places. But we'll talk about that, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks when we talk about multiple generations. But that's what it means here. Now, what it means for us as we move forward, we're not entirely sure exactly what all of that looks like. But if you look at the discussion summary and draw out of that, and you think about what it is that we want to see happen, it's obvious that we're going to need more teaching and preaching, and we have been doing teaching and preaching on worship. We're going to need to do more on the Holy Spirit so that we can understand Him and how he, who, who He is and how He works, and to, in, uh, in that, be talking about, uh, and a dialogue as we go, of, of what, what, what kind of range of expression do we see in worship, and so forth. There's going to be, need to be teaching and preaching intentionally. It means, too, that, it need, that there needs to be intentional talking among the praise teams and 
with Roberta and myself and a building together of teams. Not that teams can't be different. They, they each need to be different. There's different personalities. But that we understand worship here and where we're taking people and what it's about. Roberta's taking some steps towards some of that. She has decided to uh, lead devotions with uh, each of the praise teams. It's a good way to develop relationship and in that uh, relationship with, not just with each other and with her, but with God as well. And she did it one, the first week before she left and uh, I understand it was very well received. But there's an intentionality to that that we're going to need. We're gonna to need to be intentional about who, about identifying younger people to be part of praise teams. We're going to need to be intentional about working them into praise teams, about having training for people, about having safe places for people, about having grace for each other. Because I want to say this. We value competency. It's good to be good at what you're doing. But we're not looking for perfection and you don't always have to do it right. Because if that's the case, we're all dead. We have to have an atmosphere, a culture of grace for one another. Quite honestly, I am more concerned about the heart that is there than about whether somebody makes a mistake or not. That's okay. I make mistakes, and I hope that, 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 that that's okay too, and that we can walk our way through those things as a community too. But it takes intentionality. And then it takes intentionality to also think about and include more sharing and more testimonies. And I have to tell you, that's not something that comes naturally to me. When I work on a sermon for a service, I'm focused on that, I'm focused on the word, I'm a word kind of guy. If you want to put it this way, I'm a Gutenberg guy, I'm not a, you know, internet guy, um, and so on. And so I, I don't find myself thinking in terms of, say, media for a service or somebody to share or testimonies. It doesn't come naturally for me. But we're going to have to be intentional about doing some of that. And that's, I think, the key word for us this morning. Intentionality. To, to be stepping intentionally into worship and developing and growing the culture of worship around here and developing and growing our own hearts and the people who are part of the worship up here and behind the scenes as well. And I think God will bless that. I think what I want to do is basically just close here and invite you to stand with me while we pray, I pray, for us, for ourselves, for worship. So Father, let's stand. Father God, I pray that you will be with us as we step forward into what you have for us as a church. And that you will make clearer and clearer as we do that what it's going to look like and the style of worship and the range of worship and tilt that may be there towards the generation. And I pray, Lord, that it will not just be style and techniques, but that there will be your spirit in it. And that through your spirit, you will draw us together to be a worshiping community and that you will draw others to join with us to be a worshiping community as well. Because that's what you want. That's who you've wanted us to be all along. That's something that's been part of our DNA, I believe, from, from a long, long ways back. And we ask you to bless Roberta as she leads in that, consult myself, praise team leaders and others as we, as we sort our way through where worship is going. But may we just worship you. Worship you as the God above all gods as the joy of our hearts. And may others know, these people love Jesus. Amen.